actually there's actually he's the only bird. Barry, we're starting now. <laughs> you got ready? One, two, three. Uh, yeah, kind of face that way. One, two, three. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching. Marching, we are marching in the light of God. We are marching, marching, we are marching, marching, we are marching in the light of God. 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 We are marching in the light. Marching, we are marching in the light of God. We are marching, marching, we are marching. Will you join with me in the responsive call to worship found in your bulletin? Gather with the crowds to await the coming of Jesus. Rejoice with the disciples, for he has courageously chosen to enter the city. Cheer with the crowd. Blessed is he who comes in God's name.
That's better. Yeah. yeah. Hey. It's scary to be put in the same pen with Billy. That was ugly. Happy Palm Sunday to you all. It's good to see you. And uh, my pleasure to be able to start our service or part of our service this morning by uh, offering the invocation as we gather in worship and praise. Oh God, our eternal parent, this is a day of celebration. And yet it's time once again for us to affirm our love and our loyalty to you, to dedicate ourselves more fully to the causes and purposes of your eternal kingdom. <coughs> in so doing, we join your people in Jerusalem in 29 AD and throughout the ages and places of the world in praising you. So hear us now as we raise our songs of praise, our own shouts of Hosanna, praise to the one who once came and who yet comes among us again and again and again to bring your eternal life and love, your joy and peace. Lord, today the churches of the Western world are crowded and a festive mood fills our hearts. There are shouts from deep within the core of our beings, shouts of praise and thanksgiving for Jesus. And now we remember his words on that first Palm Sunday, that if we were silent today, these bricks and stones around us would shout out loud. And so we pray yet again, save us, Lord. Save us from lukewarm faith and callous indifference to the pain and trouble around us. Save us from skinny hopes and petty dreams. <coughs> Beg your pardon. Save us from those mental gymnastics through which we try to avoid uh, responsibility. Save us from atrophied hearts. We cry from our hearts and from the depths of our souls, Hosanna, Lord, save us. Save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so as we join your people all over the world in these moments of worship and praise, we pray that you would hold us close so that we may find your grace a grace that is stronger than our fears, of which there are many. Hold us tight so that we may look into our hearts and find your forgiveness. During this awesome and yet awful week ahead, walk with us from death to life, from denial to affirmation, from doubt to faith. This we pray in the name of the one who once came and yet comes to show your love and your mercy and your life most completely. And so with your people in all ages and in all places, we join together and say, Amen. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you. Sure, Billy. Celebration today is that we have two infant baptisms. They happen to be first cousins. And so I ask that the families, the parents, godparents, any close relatives would come now and present Jack and Finley for infant baptism.
Following the example of Jesus who welcomed children into his community, we celebrate the presence of children within our faith community and offer them the sacrament of baptism. A sacrament is a visible sign of an inward grace. In infant baptism, we see water being sprinkled on the child's head. That's the visible sign. The invisible grace it symbolizes is the unconditional love that God offers and we recognize and celebrate it in the life of the child. Also in baptism, parents promise to bring up their child in the Christian faith so that in due time, the child will have the opportunity to claim as his or her own the baptismal covenant, which the parents in church once entered on the child's behalf. And finally, in baptism, you, the congregation, pledge your resources and time and care for the continual nurture of the children. Not only do we supply programs and facilities, we are to be teachers, mentors, surrogate grandparents, and role models for the children baptized at this church. So today we celebrate the love God has for these children. We welcome them into this faith community and we promise our commitment to love and to support them on their faith journey. And so parents, first to you, do you in presenting your child for holy baptism, declare your desire to follow Christ and his teachings? Do you accept as your duty and privilege to live before them a life that becomes the gospel, to exercise all godly care, that they be brought up in the Christian faith, that they be taught the holy scriptures, and that they give reverent attendance upon the private and public worship of God. We do. We do. He's gonna be fine. We got it. We got it covered. I've had four of them. We're good. Will you endeavor to keep them under the ministry and guidance of the church until they are able to express for themselves a desire to follow Christ and be confirmed as members of Christ's holy church? What name is given this child? Jack Houston. <laughs> hey, buddy. All right, Jack Houston. I got you. Jack Houston, I baptize you in the name of God the Creator, in Christ the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good job. We got you. <laughs> what name is given this child? Finley. Finley. He had a little stay in the hospital, but is doing much better now. And we're mighty proud of you. Here we go, guy. <laughs> Finley Bradford, I baptize you in the name of God, the Creator in Christ the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go back. <laughs> Members of the household of faith, I present to your love and care Jack and Finley, who we recognize as a member of this family of God. Will you respond? With God's help, we accept And now as a congregation, we will pray for these children through song. If you'll look at the insert song in the bulletin, um, I'm going to ask our director of children's ministry, Chris Kincaid, to take, why don't you take, does it want to do Finley? I'm on this side with Jack. And uh, choir, lead the congregation in this prayer. <laughs> Here we go.
Well, we've got these wonderful banners. Linda Combs, thank you for helping make these banners for our children and others who help her with things like that. And we have baptismal certificates for you that you'll put in the attic for many, many years. But, uh, <laughs> but it, <laughs> uh, we love you. Let's give this family and Jack and Finley their first big round of applause. <laughs> That's the way to celebrate a Palm Sunday. Wow. Thank you, families. We want to do welcome you, everybody, on this Palm Sunday and the first day of Holy Week or Passion Week. And um, we offer a special welcome to those visiting with us. If you plan to be back, we'd love to order you an Asbury name tag. All you need to do is print your name on the name tag board that's in the breezeway right on the other side of this wall. And uh, we will order that for you. Please stay for coffee hour. Um, I think we have some cake, special cake to celebrate Jack and Finley's baptisms. So come on over after the service to celebrate with us. I want to welcome everybody who's worshiping with us online and they're all over the world um, uh, tuning in to us here on the corner of Henry Street and Waters Avenue. If you are online, please let us know in the chat so we know that you're part of our online community this morning. Some sad news, um, Diane Williamson, one of our great members passed away. Diane had moved to North Carolina, so we haven't seen her for a while, but we will never forget her great spirit. Um, the funeral home is, sh if you want to leave, it's pretty far away, so you probably, I think Mary Ellen Campbell might be making the trip, but I know most of us can't get up there because it's a long way, but um, it's at Sharp Funeral Home. If you would like to leave a tribute um, online, to let her family know we're praying for her. Diane was an incredible spirit and we'll miss her. Um, Sharp Funeral Home in Burlington, North Carolina, Diane Williamson, if you want to Google that later today. Just heard this morning that our Nancy Hartland passed away. I hadn't seen Nancy in a while. She had an incredible ministry, always think, thinking of people outside of our country and, and in missions, and we will miss her. Um, just, and, but her obituary is online. I think that's the Baker McCullough Funeral Home. David Alley, come give us some better news. <laughs> Several months I've been working as a volunteer with Inspiritus, a re refugee resettlement agency. And one of my jobs has been to take newly arrived clients to a supermarket for an orientation. Whenever I do one of these orientations, I remember my mother's three rules for efficient grocery shopping. Number one, never go to the grocery store on a Saturday because that's when it's most crowded. Number two, never go grocery shopping when you're hungry. And number three, always make a list because you want to get in and out as quickly as possible. Well, I'd like to invite you to go shopping with me and other members of the Coastal Interfaith Green Team at the Forsyth Farmers Market this week and we're going to ignore all of my mother's rules. <laughs> First of all, we're going this Saturday, March 30th at nine o'clock. Secondly, you can come hungry because there are many, many delicious foods to sample throughout the market. Finally, you can bring a list if you like, but come to browse and learn about this unique Savannah institution. One of the organization's staff members will meet us and share the history and philosophy of the Forsyth Farmers Market. Then we'll take a tour of the market, stopping to speak to some of the vendors who specialize in organic 
and alternative farming. So come this coming Saturday, March 30th at 9 o'clock to the south end of Forsyth Park near the sentient bean and brighter day. Look for the green tent marked information and token exchange. And don't tell my mom we broke all the rules. <laughs> so this starts Holy Week and we have services throughout this week on Thursday is the Monday Thursday service where we experience Holy Communion. That's at 730. Again, then the following night is our Good Friday Tenebrae service at 730. And uh, that particular service I don't recommend for young children. It's uh, a service of shadows. It gets very dark and it's dealing with a difficult subject. Um, but it's an incredible experience as you hear the last hours of Christ's life. Um, you don't see it, you hear it. And Ryan McCurdy, well-known community actor here in Savannah and in New York, will be playing Jesus for that service. Be sure to invite people to it. It's so powerful. Something's happening right after that. Tell us about it, Chris. First, just pay attention to priest number two. There's a debut of somebody really great. Yeah. So Saturday, next Saturday, we've got our Easter egg hunt. It's going to be at our Wesley Oak campus from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Invite everybody you know. We have 800 plus eggs, a lot of eggs. We're gonna have a bounce house. We're gonna have music. We're gonna have games and prizes. It's gonna be a ton, a ton, ton, ton of fun. So please be sure to invite everybody you know. All families are welcome. Wesley Oak, next Saturday, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. He hadn't quite reached 80. He's not an octogenarian yet, but it happens to be his birthday today, and he's helping lead worship it's Bob Townsend's birthday today. Let's sing happy birthday to Bob. <laughs> anniversaries to celebrate and they're online folks so first of all Jane and Jerry Timmy who were part of this congregation for a long time but then moved away on Tuesday they celebrate their 58th wow. 58th anniversary and Roger and Diane Amerson on Thursday will be celebrating their 60th right up here here we go <laughs> If you haven't received it yet, you should be receiving a letter from me about our special Easter offering that we always do each Easter. Just want to highlight two things about it. Half of that special offering will go to invite children to our Vacation Bible School in June who don't normally have that opportunity. We're contacting the people for from Family Promise, from Inspiritus, from Wesley Community Centers. And so there are, you know, costs for, we supply supper and t-shirts and materials. So to cover that cost, 
half of the Christ, um, Easter offering will be going to cover the cost of these children participating. And I'm excited that we're really reaching out beyond our walls to extend this opportunity to other children who might not normally have that opportunity. The other half of the offering goes to our emergency fund to help people who are in crisis situations. So hopefully that's in the mail to you if you haven't re, uh, received it already. Then please circle April 7th. That's two weeks, I believe, from today. April 7th, we will be celebrating the ministry of Reverend Lynn Drake, who served here as our associate minister and then went over to Wesley Oak and served as the senior minister there for many, many years. So what we're going to do, I'm hoping to get Lynn to participate in our service that Sunday, but what we're doing at one o'clock, there'll be a lunch celebration over at the Wesley Oak campus. So instead of having our big coffee hour here, bring your goodies to the church, that then we'll then take over um, to Wesley Oak. Our churches will be um, supplying the meats. You can still bring meats too, that's fine too, but we'll be supp supplying the main meat. But the celebration will be that Sunday. We won't have our big coffee hour, April 7th, and we'll go over to Wesley Oak. Don't forget about our newsletter and our website. Double check and make sure your cell phones are off. And at this time, I invite children up through the fifth grade to the wonderful Godly Play program. This way, gang. This way. Good morning. Good morning. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had re reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. For the word of God in scripture and story, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, we give thanks.
want to remind everybody that I think there is an Easter lily form if you would like to place an, in your bulletin, if you'd like to place uh, an, uh, a lily in honor or in memory of a loved one next Sunday on Easter. I also want to remind you that, that we'll have the living cross in the courtyard where people are invited to bring live flowers um, at the beginning of the service and to place them on the living cross. It's a beautiful experience. And of course, we always have people taking pictures um, with the living cross after the Easter service when it's just beautifully decked out with all of the flowers. Of course, you'll probably want to take pictures in here next Sunday with the lilies, but also because of the incredible waterfall, river of life, and streams of, of life that um, our worship team have designed for us this year. It's just been amazing for our Sunday services and our Taze services. Would you give a hand to our worship team? Thank you. <clears throat> I have a good friend who was inducted Good friend, whoops, sorry, let me get this straight. Can you hear me okay? I have a good friend in Savannah who was inducted into the Irish America Hall of Fame in County Wexford, Ireland. And at the time of this honor, about five years ago, he was one of only 59 people to be inducted. So I'm going to call him Mr. Irish. And I have known Mr. Irish for about 50 years He's been a dear, dear friend, and I especially feel close to him because he saved the life of one of my children when she got a cookie lodged in her throat as a toddler, and it was a very close call. So I owe him Mr. Irish a lot. He has always been in great physical shape, uh, but he is now in his early 80s, so his step is naturally a little slower. He's always loved working in his yard, and he still does, but not quite as often as he used to. Obviously, Mr. Irish is a big fan of St. Patrick's Day. He's even been the Grand Marshal of the parade. He and his family have walked the parade for decades. He walked it with his father. He walked it with his children. He's walked it with his children's children. And when you see him walking in the parade, he's as happy as a lark. He radiates when he's walking in the parade. I didn't make it downtown to see the parade this year, but last Saturday I turned on the television to watch part of it. He and his family have walked in the parade for decades, and I wanted to see if he was walking in it today this last Saturday. The television happened to be on WSAV's channel, and the parade was already in progress, so I may have missed him. But unbelie unbelievably, I kid you not, the very first words out of the reporter's mouth when the picture came on the screen was, and now we have Mr. Irish and his family. Very first words. I couldn't believe it. And the reporters talked about Mr. Irish and his family for several minutes. And I saw that my friend was riding in a car this year, in a convertible. He looked sharp, had a great coat on, had a big smile, and had a big wave to everybody. And I thought to myself, I'm glad he's riding in a car this year and not trying to walk the parade anymore. I watched about 15 minutes and decided to see what the parade looked like on a different channel. So I turned it to WTOC. And WTOC's location on the parade route must have been after WSAV's because I kid you not, unbelievably, I am not kidding, the very first words out of the reporter's mouth after I changed the channel was, and now we have Mr. Irish and his great family. It was unbelievable. But what was even stranger was that Mr. Irish was not in the convertible. He was walking beside it. 
He had gotten out of the car and was walking the parade, and he looked great. He didn't look like he was in his 80s. He wasn't bent over at all or walking slowly. His shoulders were back, and he looked nine feet tall. Three days later, I happened to drive by his house, and he happened to be getting his mail out of his mailbox, which was on the street curb. He had gotten it out and was walking back to his house, and he was all bent over, and he was moving slow and kind of had a limp. That's not how he looked on Saturday. He looked and moved like he was 40 years old. How did he do it? The power of the human spirit. What we can do, what we can accomplish when we want to, when our adrenaline is flowing, is simply remarkable. I can't jump. Can't jump a lick maybe an inch or two off the ground, if that. I always wanted to know what it was like to feel like to dunk a basketball, but I could never even touch the bottom of the net, much less get up to the rim. But one night, during a high school football game at Memorial Stadium, I was defending a pass play. The ball was thrown by the quarterback of the opposing team and it was going to a receiver who was behind me. I started running to my left, but noticed the ball was way up high to my right. It was too high for me to touch. But in the supercharged energy of the game, I pivoted to the right and for some reason jumped anyway. And somehow I came down with the ball in my right hand. One hand. And I couldn't believe it. My teammates couldn't believe it. Hester can't jump, they'd say. (laughs) We couldn't have gotten that ball. How did he get it? Now, I know some of you are thinking that Billy's telling a tall tale. (laughs) In fact, I've even questioned the reality that this happened because it was so long ago. But last year, out of the blue, One of my old teammates told me that he ended up with the film of that game, and he sent me a video copy of that one play. And I just posted it on YouTube. (laughs) Correction, Sherry posted on YouTube for me, because I don't know how to do that kind of thing. It's only about 12 seconds long. It's got about 20 views on it. And they are all by me. (laughs) I keep watching it because I can't believe it. I don't know how it happened. I can't jump. You know, you can look at it yourself, but let me warn you, the film quality is very poor. It was filmed in the 70s, and it wasn't made for television to be shown. It was just the school recording the game so the coaches could show it to us and tell us what we did right and wrong. It's very poor quality, there's no sound. So it's difficult to see and it goes by fast. But if you look at it, to be able to tell what is going on, it may help you to know that I am on the team that's with the white jersey and the white pants. I am on defense and I intercept the ball right on the 45 yard line. But what's kinda cool, if you hit pause right at the peak of my jump, The picture gets even blurrier when you pause. And since I am wearing white pants and a white jersey, and it's so blurry, I kind of look like an angel. (laughs) Or a ghost hovering in the air above everybody else. Me, who can't jump. Don't pay attention to the fact that after I caught the ball, I start running in the wrong direction. I did that on purpose, folks. I did. After I jumped to the moon, the momentum of my fall took me in that direction, and I thought I would go with it and maybe fool the other team, but that didn't work, so I turned back the right way and only ran a few yards. But how did I get that ball? The power of the human spirit. What we can do, what we can accomplish when we want to, when our adrenaline is flowing, it's remarkable. 
Last Sunday, I told you about a man named Aristides de Sousa Mendes. Portugal's consul general in Bordeaux, France in 1940. The Germans had invaded France, so over 30,000 refugees fled from the Nazis and surrounded de Sousa Mendes's consulate, begging for visas so they could go to neutral Spain or Portugal and then to either America or Britain or somewhere else far out of the Nazis' reach. But the Portuguese dictator Antonio Salazar said no, there should be no visas granted. That's a strict order. But de Sousa Mendez was a devout Catholic. And after three days of praying blood, sweat, and tears, he decided that he had to help the refugees. And he personally stamped all of the visas and saved the lives of over 30,000 people. He knew he would be in trouble. He knew he would be punished harshly. How did he have the strength to do this courageous act? Dictator Salazar basically made de Sousa Mendez's life miserable. He was a walking dead man. He ordered that no one could associate with de Sousa Mendez or his family. He could no longer practice law. This once wealthy attorney ended up getting his meals from a soup kitchen. He died penniless in 1954, no obituary, no public announcement. None of the 30,000 plus refugees and their descendants never knew they owed their life to this one man who gave up everything. I forgot to mention last Sunday that it wasn't until 1988 that Portugal dropped the charges against him and declared him a national hero. Before he died, he said that he would, have, would do it all over again, no matter what, because it was the right thing to do. It's what God wanted him to do. How did he do it? The power of the human spirit, what we can do, what we can accomplish when we are determined is simply remarkable. And he would also tell us that he was able to do it because of his faith, his trust in God. Remember, he famously said, I would rather stand with God against man than with man against God. It was this kind of unique courage and faith that Jesus tapped into on the day we're celebrating the day when he rode into Jerusalem. He knew what was going to happen to him. He was known as a prophet. That's what it said at the end of our text today that Beth read. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil asking, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. He was a prophet. And things often don't end well for prophets. Isaiah was sawed in half with a wood saw. Jeremiah was stoned to death. Zechariah was stoned to death. Micah was thrown off a cliff by orders of the king. Yes, there were prophets who were fortunate enough to die of natural causes, but there were many who were tortured and killed because their job as a prophet was to cry out for systemic change that threatened the power structures. Jesus of course, knew about this danger as a Jew and knowing the history, but also because, remember, of his cousin John. John the Baptist, who had been beheaded for being a prophet and for crying out for change. Jesus also knew that he was in danger because the Romans had their guard up. The Romans were well aware at this time of year, Jews were flocking to Jerusalem from all over the known world to celebrate what? Passover. And what is Passover? 
a time to remember the good old days, remembering when the Jews had been slaves in Egypt, but the great God of Abraham through Moses led them out of slavery. God liberated them to freedom and independence. And remember what the word salvation means? Liberation. But those days are gone. Long gone. The Jews are no longer free. They're under Roman Roman rule. They they are slaves again. And now it's Passover, which would be like our 4th of July. It'd be like if the United States had been taken over by a dictator again, or a king, and no longer had our freedom. But now we're going to celebrate the 4th of July. Crazy, right? (laughs) So all of these Jews are coming together in Jerusalem to remember this special time when they were free. People everywhere, people upset, longing for freedom. And that's why the Romans at this time of year would have a military parade. Every Passover, they would send extra troops to Jerusalem, foot soldiers, soldiers on war horses, and they'd parade into town showing that the power is here. The governor, Pontius Pilate, who lived in Caesarea, would make the 60-mile trip to oversee things, to make sure the Jews stayed in line. And if they didn't, they would be dealt with, crucified. Happened all the time. There were faster and cheaper ways to kill people, but it was the best way to deal with rebellions. If someone was seen as a threat to the system, if any people excited the Jews, the Romans would crucify them because they wanted to humiliate them, torture them in front of other Jews to strike fear in them. If it happened to him, it could happen to me. It was the ultimate form of suffering, humiliation, and intimidation. And so the Romans have a military parade from the west, and Jesus organizes a different kind of procession from the east. It's clear what this planned demonstration of Jesus means. It's an acting out of a well-known passage from the Hebrew Scriptures. It's where the prophet Zechariah spoke of two different kinds of kings entering Jerusalem. The king of peace, who will enter Jerusalem riding on a donkey, and the warrior king who will enter Jerusalem riding on a war horse. And the point is not that Zechariah predicted Palm Sunday. The point is that these are known symbols that Jesus would have been familiar with. He would have known about the royal imperial procession from the west, and he deliberately sets up a counter-procession from the east, made up of peasants, by the way. Jesus is making a statement by the way he enters the city. By the way, the people who lined up to welcome Jesus into the city were not the same people who were yelling to crucify him. I remember as a child seeing this in movies, how they made it look like the people who had once praised Jesus going into Jerusalem had now turned on him and were now yelling to crucify him. Isn't it horrible how they turned on him like that? Different group, folks. Totally different group. I would give anything if every Christian knew the story of Holy Week. I mean, really knew it. Because it is the story that should shape our understanding of Jesus. Of what it means to be Christian. Of what it means to follow Him and to follow the way He revealed and embodied. And since the story of Holy Week is so essential, it's important to get the most accurate information possible about that week. And not just the information we learned 30, 20, 10 years ago, but information we're now learning today. And that's why, oh, I wish every Christian could read a book by scholars Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan called The Last Week. Read it! It's that important for your faith. You know, in high school, I only played one year on the basketball team. I had played basketball my whole life. 
But when I played in high school that one year, it wasn't on the varsity team, it was what we called the JV team, the junior varsity team. The JV team was usually made up of the younger, less, ex less experienced players who would eventually move up to the varsity team. But after that first year, I knew my basketball days were over. I could shoot, dribble, and pass, but remember, I couldn't jump except on that one night in Memorial Stadium. But unless you are very tall, it's essential to be able to jump in basketball. Now the plays we ran and the defenses we ran on that JV team were pretty basic. They were not as complicated as the ones that the varsity team ran. Unfortunately, most Christians only know the JV version of Holy Week. And since it is the story that shapes our understanding of Christ and how, are we, and how we are to live as Christians, it's essential for Christians to understand the varsity story of Holy Week. And sadly, many do not. And one reason they do not is because many ministers don't know the varsity story depending on what seminary they went to and if they are continuing to learn about scholarly discoveries. One reason for the demise of the United Methodist denomination is because many of our ministers started going to schools that only taught the JV version. And they, of course, only told JV stories to their congregations. And that's one reason. We lost the Wesleyan Quadrilateral, that very important resource of scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. It's also why the Methodists stopped being one of the leaders in social justice ministries. Methodism was the leader. And then went backwards. Because they were only told the JV story. It's so important to know the varsity stories. It's so important to keep learning and not just settling for past information. Many of you know Sherry, how Sherry and I met, but most of you only know the JV version. Here's the JV version. I moved to New York in 1981 to pursue a theatrical career. I was part of a support group for actors at Marble Collegiate Church. In 1982, we had a special event at that support group that drew a lot of people in the arts who didn't normally attend, a number of guests. I see this really cute visitor, this new girl, that I was kind of attracted to. She does not see me. I wanted to introduce myself, but I chickened out. I told myself if she came back the following week, I would introduce myself then. She did not come back. There goes that. The following week, I got cast as Pippin in a production of the musical Pippin being performed in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I had a car, so I called my agent up and asked if there was someone in the cast that would want to drive up to me to New Hampshire. He said, why don't you call the girl playing opposite you? I have her name and number. I said, yeah, bring it on. So I called her, and she said, yes, I'll ride with you. I go pick her up. She opens the door, and it was that girl I wanted to meet two weeks before. It was weird, really weird, especially if you know how seldom actors work. <laughs> we hit it off right away, and the rest is history. That's the JV story. <laughs> and all of that is true. All of that is true, but that's not the varsity story. There are some important facts left out of the JV story. For instance, when I met Sherry, I was in a relationship with another young woman. That's not in the JV story. Billy, what were you doing wanting to meet this gal when you were already in a relationship? Good question. First of all, both me and the other girl were seeing other people. It wasn't a committed relationship yet. 
But here was the real issue. She was a great deal older than me. I didn't know it when I first met her. I was 23 playing a 19-year-old. She was playing a 19-year-old. I had no idea she was a lot older. She was one of those unique ingenues who could be playing a young person for a long time. I'm not going to tell you how much older, but it's in one of my books, so if you want to buy a book, you'll find out. <laughs> but she had a problem with the age difference. It concerned her. Again, I was 23 and probably pretty immature. She was a wonderful person, and looking back, I respect, I really respect her wisdom. But we still dated for a while, even after I met Sherry, and that complicated things a bit for Sherry and me. Incredibly, Sherry was in between relationships when we met, which is kind of a miracle because she always had been in a relationship. When she was at Northwestern University, she dated a hundred men in the theater department. <laughs> Fortunately, 99 of them were gay, so we're okay. <laughs> Here's another part of the varsity story that is not in the JV story. During the first 20 years of our marriage, we spent about 12 of those years going to marriage counseling. We were in therapy. Relationships are complex. I was from the South, Sherry from the North. Sherry was an only child, whereas I had a zillion relatives that were like brothers and sisters to me that I liked to see all the time. Sherry liked to schedule everything. I liked spontaneity. And there were a lot more complicated, complicated issues than those. Fortunately, Sherry and I have a lot of love and respect for each other. And both of us have a faith and a God that mean an awful lot to us to help us stay committed. By the way, we don't always agree on how we, we see things about our faith, but we both have great respect for each other's walk with God. I like to have fun with our JV story. It's charming. But it's really not the story the world needs to hear. The last thing couples need to hear and believe is that a marriage is like a Disney movie with just happy endings and happy experiences. Couples need to hear the varsity story. They need to hear that relationships can be messy and complex because you see, it's the varsity stories in life that give us hope. That's one of my cousin said to me after he had gone through a divorce and he learned that Sherry and I went to therapy, he said, Billy, you and Sherry go to therapy? Really? If I had known that, maybe I would have gone to therapy with my ex-wife. <laughs> Farsity stories are the, the most authentic stories and are the ones we need to hear. For you see, this sermon does not end today, just like this service does not end today. This is one of the few Sundays we don't sing Here I Am, Lord, at the end of the service. It's not the end of the service because it continues to Monday, Thursday, it continues to Good Friday, and then it finally comes to Easter where it will end. So next Sunday, I'll conclude this sermon by telling you the Easter story the varsity version. God bless you during your holy week. Amen and amen. At this time now, let us worship God with our tithes and our offerings.
offerings be one way for us to join the crowd in their proclam proclamation of Hosanna. Lord, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And may these gifts and we ourselves be involved in a ministry of reconciliation, of justice, of love and mercy to a needing world. Through Christ we pray. Amen.
I said, we're not really ending this service, and that's why we're not singing Here I Am, Lord, at the end. In fact, we ask, if you will, to leave in silence, but then go over to the social hall and party with Jack and Finley, okay, because they have cake for you. Will you join me in the closing litany? Follow Jesus slowly. Follow at a donkey's pace. Do not forget Thursday. Do not run past Friday. Do not speed to Easter Sunday. Follow to the temple. Follow to the upper room. Follow to the garden. Follow to the judgment hall. Follow through the city gates. Follow through the cross. Go, giving thanks that Jesus did not raise an army, draw a sword, or run away to safety. Go, giving thanks that Jesus trod the path of peaceful love to the bitter end. Go in the Lord's peace. <laughs>